What's up guys, welcome to Melbourne. Thought we'd do something different today to start the video. Finally gonna tell you guys about what I've been working on. Hang on, there's a little smudge. I'm literally founding this. I'm not getting paid to talk about this or something like that. This is my baby. I'm founding two companies, one of which I can tell you about today. Um, it's really cool. I'm super excited about it. It's called Cal VPN. Cal stands for quantum algorithms because this is the first post-quantum VPN. Only VPN that will protect you from powerful quantum computers. There's a massive threat that we're currently facing, like right now. Uh, hackers are probably stealing data all over the world with the intent of breaking the encryption when these powerful quantum computers arrive in the future. They can steal this data right now, even if you have a VPN. The VPN just encrypts the data so people can't read it, right? But these powerful quantum computers will be able to break this encryption in the future. So in like, say five years, when powerful quantum computers exist, you know, they can steal your VPN, protect encrypted data right now to then break in five years. So all your data on the internet, on your phone, is literally not safe. We do have shitty quantum computers currently. They exist, right? Uh, the tech exists. It's just a matter of scaling up the tech. It's looking like about five years for powerful quantum computers. So you might be wondering how the hell will this software protect you from quantum computers? Well, it uses these advanced quantum algorithms. It's not ready just yet. It's about two to four months away. I'm still working on the code. So I need you guys to do me one small favor. Like it'll mean the world to me. Uh, I'll be so appreciative. Even if you're not interested uh, in this software, if you don't care about you know protecting your data, that's fine. But if you enjoy watching my YouTube, help me out because it'll actually help me out a lot. So what I need you to do is go to my website here, calvpn.com uh, and enter your email address and click submit. Why? Because this will show investors that people are interested. Watch this space and CalVPN is coming. If you wanna protect yourself from corner computers, you know, if you don't want your nudes on the internet, you should probably consider this software because powerful quantum computers are coming and you know there's nothing we can do about it they're going to break all of today's encryption we need better encryption all right and that's what these post quantum algorithms can do for you anyway that's enough for now i'll tell you guys more about it soon let's get into the main video and get back in my room so as you can probably tell i've uh, joined up with the marines uh, and they've, they've cut my hair like this i actually did it myself pretty proud of it that's I actually always cut my own hair. That's why it always looks so awful. Uh, I saw Elon always cuts his own hair as well. I was like, but yeah, I love cutting my own hair. It's kind of it's kind of fun. It saves a lot of money. I don't know why people don't try it. Um, but yeah, I might cut this bit off. Give me an F in the chat if you think I should uh, cut it off. The back looks terrible, so I'm not showing you that. I, when I first did it, it was like a bowl cut. <laughs> it looked terrible. So, and then I try to just like lob more and it, yeah, it's kind of like, it looks like a Viking now from behind, which is cool. So it's all good. Today we're going to be checking out it's, uh, someone you probably don't know. Uh, he's very bad at explaining science. <laughs> just kidding. I'm sure you've all watched at least one of his videos and he, you know, he's YouTube famous for a reason. He is awesome. His videos are great. Let me double check that. Yep. Okay, we're filming. So, we're going to watch a Veritasium video because, you know, some, some of you guys have requested it. Uh, I have seen his videos before. I think he's amazing. So, let's, you know, he always has experts on. So, there's, there's not too much reason for me to watch it. I'm sure a lot of it, most of it is correct. I have seen some misleading titles, though. Anyway, let's find a video to watch. Um, the Absurd Search for Dark Matter. It is pretty absurd. There's really not much we know. Uh, I'm sure you guys are sick of Dark Matter. Let's have a look. What what else has he got? Clickbait is unreasonably effective. That is very true. YouTube has just turned into clickbait land, hasn't it? And it's really quite annoying because unless you play the game, you really can't get anywhere. Um, I just want to find a couple titles that I've seen before that I really don't like all that much like this one parallel worlds probably exist here's why see i that's not that's not good um saying they probably exist and obviously he's referring to many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and he probably has some you know famous people on there telling 
everyone why it's correct, but there's a bunch of interpretations. And actually, the more popular one is the Copenhagen interpretation, which does not suggest there are parallel worlds. And so I don't think this is good. You know, this is not good. He, but I understand it because we're doing something somewhat similar. You know, you're trying to get people to click uh, and then you give them some real information, you know. But that's a good question whether or not we should be allowed to say stuff that's somewhat misinformation, you know, in the titles. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's keep going. Obviously, you can't just completely ban misinformation because then we'll, you know, when there's new science, everyone's going to be like misinformation and then no one ever learns anything new. So freedom of speech, guys, it's very important. What else have we got? How COD saved the Vikings. That sounds, I want to watch that. Uh, I actually found out the other day, if you're following me on Instagram, I found out that I was, uh, that I am 1 16th Norwegian from Norway. Scandinavian, 6 point, what is it, 6.25%, and it explains why my mum has uh, bigger forearms than me, because she's a Viking. Check out my shirt as well, I got a cowboy, I've been wearing this the last few videos, but I didn't show you guys, it's Cowboy Bebop. <laughs> does anyone, does any anime fans out there, what else has he got? Spinning black holes, lots of awesome stuff, why boredom is good for you. Interesting. There's, I've definitely seen a lot of titles that I'm like, oh, you know, that's really, that's a, not a great title. Um, like, I remember another one, it was like, post-truth, why, why facts aren't important anymore or something. And it's like, what? What? That, that's not okay to, you know, spread. I really disagree with that. Uh, here it is, post-truth, why facts don't matter anymore. That's not, is, you know, is that really doing a good thing for society? Um, this is true. It is mostly wrong, but that's just how science is meant to be. Why anecdotes trump data. Mm. So, you again, I really don't like that title because um, I get where the point he's probably going to make. You know, a human stories are what we remember. Um, it seems to be how our memory is really, like, designed. It just remembers visual stories. Seems to be a good reason for it. It's like if you were to, you know, tell a story about how this lion nearly ate your kid or something, well, or whatever, you're going to remember it, um, this visual story. because uh, So maybe it's like a survival mechanism, you know, when someone tells you something crazy, you remember it. Uh, so, you know, you don't, you stay away from the lions or something. Um, and if you've ever like try to remember a really long number it's really hard but if you associate like digits with um like pictures of things it's actually really easy uh and there's this technique called the mind palace technique and if you've ever heard of the memory championships this is how they do those insane you know feats of memory where they're given like decks of cards and they they remember like five decks of cards in i don't know like 10 minutes um, like the, the, the color, you know, all, everything about the card. And then they completely just write it all down, uh, and get it completely correct. This is how they do it. This mind palace technique. And there's a bit of history to it. It's like, uh, back, I think it might've been the Roman times, you know, when we didn't have like iPads and stuff to write on <laughs> or paper. Um, you know, how did people go to a lecture, you know, for, when they're studying, how did they learn stuff? How did they, you know, take notes? Apparently, they developed this mind palace technique back then to remember stuff. Um, and to give you guys a quick demo, it's like if you just remember like walking through your house and in each room, you know, something interesting is happening. Um, like, you know, there's a dinosaur, there's a T-Rex eating, a, you know, a dog or something. And you associate, you know, the T of the T-Rex with a number or a letter. And then the same with the dog. And then you, you know, you, you, you create this story and wherever you go, it links to, uh, numbers or letters and you can remember stuff like that. It's really amazing. I tried this, uh, I was bored one day and I tried to remember the, the digits of pi and I, I got to like 50 within like 10 minutes. So it really does work. It's quite incredible. Um, and I actually, I remember watching this video and they were bringing people into MRIs, I, I think it was, and they were looking at uh, people's brains, 
right? And they got just these random people to remember, I mean, these random people to like, uh, to learn this technique and do some other memory stuff. And after like six weeks, their, that region of their brain literally grew. Um, and all of those memory championship guys, they all claim their memory is like nothing special. They have very normal memories. Um, so what does that say about like our individual capabilities? So, you know, recon- you know, if you think you're not capable of stuff, just reconsider. You really might be able to develop your brain like a muscle. And if you remember, Einstein had uh, one part of his brain that was like overdeveloped. Uh, you know, so maybe that was just from doing a lot of math. Maybe he wasn't born that way. Maybe he grew it. Some, you know, something to think about. I'm no neuroscientist, so you know, go speak to a neuroscientist on that one. But anyway, I've been talking for a long time. We should watch a video. I hope I'm not boring you. Uh, I saw one that I want to watch. Here we go. Half the universe was missing until now. Mm, I remember when this news came out. So let's see what. The man has to say. He's also Australian, this by the way. So Australian, was sponsored by Kiwi Co- Australia represent. I really like him, by the way. You know, I hope I'm not giving off a, the wrong impression. I think he's wonderful. So, uh, I think he's from Sydney, New South Wales. Uh, so he's not... I'm from Melbourne. Melbourne's much better if you ever visit Australia. Until recently, half the universe was missing or hidden or just undetected. Thing about dark matter or dark energy, which make up 27 and 68% of our universe respectively. No, I'm talking about normal, ordinary matter. So, like, so yes, dark matter, dark energy, it makes up those percentages he just said in terms of total energy and matter, like everything. But dark matter actually makes up 80% of all matter in the universe. So... I think because he's just said 5% matter, you know, it it can be a bit confusing, you know. Which makes up you and me and the planets and stars and nebulae and basically everything you can see. And since most of this stuff is made of protons and neutrons, which are forms of baryons, this has been known as the missing baryon problem. We expect the universe to be made up of 5% baryonic matter, but when we go looking, we only find 2.5%. Now, the first question you're probably asking is, why should we expect the universe to be 5% ordinary baryonic matter in the first place? The answer is, because with that density, we can explain the relative abundances of different elements that we observe in the universe, specifically the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen to helium. In the beginning, like right after the Big Bang, There were all of these neutrons and protons whizzing around. It was incredibly hot and there was tons of radiation. The universe was radiation dominated. But as the universe expanded, it cooled to the point where protons and neutrons could start fusing together. A particularly stable nucleus to form would be helium-4, made of two neutrons and two protons. The problem was, to form helium-4, you first have to form deuterium, one proton and one neutron. And this is a less stable nucleus, and as quickly as it formed, it would get smashed apart. But by about 10 seconds after the Big Bang, the universe had cooled sufficiently that deuterium could form. And as soon as it did, it would rapidly fuse into helium. The rate at which this happened depended on the density of matter in the early universe. The higher the density, the faster this fusion could occur. Then by 20 minutes after the Big Bang, the temperature had dropped low enough that fusion could no longer occur. And so at this point, the elemental abundances were locked in, like a snapshot of this moment. There was 75% hydrogen and 25% helium by mass, which is basically still what we observe in the universe today. Of the hydrogen nuclei, 26 out of every million were deuterium. What's amazing about deuterium is that it's stable, it doesn't decay, and there are no known processes that can produce it in significant quantities since the Big Bang. And that means virtually all the deuterium in the universe today, including the one out of every 6,000 hydrogen atoms in tap water, was created not in stars, but in the first 20 minutes after the Big Bang. That's very cool. 
When we look deep into space, the oldest light we can see is the cosmic microwave background radiation, the afterglow of the Big Bang, which has been traveling through the universe unimpeded since about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So we can literally count up those photons and work out the density of radiation right after the Big Bang and using the value of 26 deuterium nuclei per million hydrogen nuclei, well, we can work out the ratio of baryonic matter to photons. And that is how we work out that there should be about 5% baryonic matter in the universe. So in the late 1990s, scientists went looking for all this baryonic matter. It was a census of sorts. They added up all of the planets and stars and black holes, and galaxies, dust clouds, gas, basically everything you can see or infer exists using a telescope. And what they found is that everything that I normally think of as the actual stuff in our universe, it only makes up barely 20% of all the baryonic matter. So where is the rest? Well, not all ordinary matter is glowing brightly or is illuminated by nearby stars. It's not dark matter, but it is ordinary matter that is just in darkness. And so if you want to find those baryons, well, one way is to use a backlight, a bright source of light very far away. And that also means in the very early universe. And quasars are the perfect backlight. Their luminosity can be thousands of times that of whole galaxies. Accretion disk of a supermassive black hole at the center of an early galaxy, as it engulfs all this matter. And since it is so distant, the light we receive from quasars is heavily redshifted. For example, the light emitted when a hydrogen atom goes from its first excited state to its ground state, the Lyman alpha transition, it produces ultraviolet light of around 121.6 nanometers in a lab. But from a quasar, it can be observed as a peak in their spectrum at over 560 nanometers. That is yellow light. What's fascinating is if you look to the left of this peak, you see many little dips. These are absorption lines created by neutral hydrogen atoms that lie along our line of sight with the quasar. When light from the quasar reaches neutral hydrogen, the photons that can excite the electrons from the ground state to the first excited state are absorbed. This is the same Lyman alpha transition. But since these patches of hydrogen gas are closer to us, they are less redshifted. So the notches they make in the spectrum are at shorter and shorter wavelengths. The that was a brilliant explanation. He did that with you know, the visuals so well. I'm sure you guys get closer that. the so gases great. to us. This has been described as the Lyman Alpha Forest. It's like a one dimensional map that shows us where and how much neutral hydrogen gas lies along the line connecting us to the quasar. Really. Adding all of that neutral hydrogen gas into our baryon budget brings us almost to 50%. So where is the other half of the baryons? Well, computer simulations of the entire universe suggest that they are out there just in between. So this is what I've been doing in my PhD, which is using cosmological simulations of dark matter and body simulations, which you know, it's just dark matter and, you know, we turn on gravity essentially uh, in these huge volumes, you know, that are approaching the size of the universe. And then we add baryonic matter through like, uh, you know, semi-analytic models. Galaxies in these sheets or filaments, and they're very spread out, just one to 10 particles per cubic meter. Plus, these particles are ionized, so they don't absorb the light like the neutral hydrogen gas. And they're in a temperature range between about 100,000 and 10 million Kelvin, Lusters. a range astronomers like to refer to as warm hot. So this is known as the warm hot intergalactic medium, or WIM for short. But finding Cosmic the WIM web. has been a real challenge. Because they're ionized, and because of their temperature, they only emit or absorb in the high energy UV or low energy X-rays. Now, some people have used very sophisticated techniques to try to find the WIM, but then recently, a naturally occurring physical phenomenon allowed us to find all of the missing baryons. 
Let's find out how. First, we need to talk lightning. And I promise this is related. Okay, so did you know that it's possible to detect lightning from the other side of the Earth? This is because lightning produces a flash of electromagnetic radiation in all parts of the spectrum. I mean, we see the white light, but there's also broad spectrum radio waves which are released. And if you were nearby, you could detect those as a pulse. But the very low frequency radio waves can actually travel up and out of the atmosphere, and they get guided along the Earth's magnetic field lines out several radii from the Earth, and then back down where they can be detected in the other hemisphere. Except if they're detected there, they don't come in as a single pulse. Instead, they are spread out as a whistler. Now, if you play these radio waves through a speaker, we can actually hear them. So listen to this. Cool. You hear that descending tone that sounds like a sci-fi laser gun? Yeah, that is lightning on the other side of the Earth. So what's happening here? Well, as the radio waves travel through the Earth's magnetosphere, they encounter free electrons, which slows them down, and more for the lower frequency waves. This is dispersion. Just as a prism separates white light into its component colors, the plasma in the magnetosphere separates the radio waves into its component frequencies. Low frequencies are slowed down more than high frequencies. So what started as a pulse ends up as a whistler. And the amount of dispersion tells you how many free electrons that radio wave had to pass through to reach the detector. Now just imagine, we could do something very similar to find all the ionized baryons in the universe. All we would need is a bright flash of radio waves somewhere in the distant universe. And as if on cue in 2007, astronomers found the first fast radio burst, which is just what it sounds like, a very short duration pulse of intense radio waves. And it came from the deep universe from other galaxies. Now these pulses can be incredibly powerful. I'm talking billions or trillions of times as powerful as the sun, but they last for an order of a millisecond. We don't really know what creates them, though some people suspect that it's magnetars or neutron stars or some sort of collision between these very powerful massive objects like black holes and neutron stars. But for our purposes, all we need to know is that those flashes exist. So we have seen uh, more recently than this video, some in our galaxy. Uh, we still don't know exactly what they are, but it looks like they're coming from magnetars. And that we can use them to look at their dispersion and figure out how many ionized baryons are between us and the source. And Ready this is exactly what pause. one recent paper did. Which are neutron stars uh, with really intense magnetic fields essentially. in nature. They plotted out the dispersion measure of several of these fast radio bursts versus the redshift of their host galaxy. And what they found was, sure enough, the further out these fast radio bursts were, the more dispersed their signal when it reached the Earth. And in fact, using their measurements, they were able to estimate the total baryonic matter that is out there. And that includes all the ionized particles in the WIM. And they found... Millennium simulation. That's the one I used to play around with uh, when I was first getting into this stuff. Uh, back in my honors before my PhD. It's, yeah, it was one of the first... Well, not the first, but like it, was, it, it made headlines. And it was hu hugely famous. There's been a lot of work done with the Millennium Dark Matter Cosmological Simulation. It's so cool that it was 5%. They found the missing baryons. Roughly 50% of them are in that warm, hot intergalactic medium. And so this validates what we had been thinking the whole time. You know what surprised me in making this video? I was realizing just how little of the ordinary matter from the Big Bang ended up in things like stars and galaxies, what I normally consider as the stuff of the universe. No, that's only like 10 or 20% of all the baryonic matter. Well, that really depends if dark energy is even real and if dark matter is even real. You know, we could have this whole shebang wrong um, and it's starting to look like we're, we we possibly do. So, you know, we really shouldn't be too sure of this story.
that we have currently, uh, you know, we're currently telling ourselves. There's evidence for this stuff, sure, but it doesn't mean it's, you know, we still don't know what dark matter even is, whether it's a particle or not, you know, <laughs> we really don't know. So we've got to be very careful when we're talking about what he's talking about or dark matter or dark energy. It's very mysterious stuff still. Uh, it's unknown territory. So anyway, I was going to speak a little on the cosmological sims after this. So it turns out the formation of these interesting structures is a really inefficient process. But this finding is yet another triumph for science. Those computer simulations run decades ago turned out largely to be correct. And so everyone involved should be congratulated. But this also highlights for me the difference between scientists and non-scientists. I feel like non-scientists like being right. They like when things turn out the way they were expecting. But scientists, on the other hand, they want things to work out not the way they expected. Because that's, that's the way we get clues into what new physics is still out there to be discovered. I guess for now, we'll have to be content with being right. A lot of people say that, but yeah, we also like to be right. That's how you win. I mean, you can win a Nobel Prize for being wrong as well, because then you've discovered something. You've discovered that, you know, something we loved might be wrong. Uh, but anyway, these cosmological sims, you might be wondering, like, why are we doing simulations on computers, supercomputers, you know, of the universe? Like, how does that help? Uh, well, you know, that's, that's our laboratory, essentially, you know, because the universe is very big and very old. And you know, we look out at this somewhat static universe, you know, we can't sit around for a million years to see what 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 happens so we simulate it and you can you can run time forwards and backwards very quickly and you can see how things form um, and you can from that then make predictions about what we will see in the real universe so that's it's incredibly useful um, and a lot of uh, these theoretical predictions we've made via simulations of the universe have you know turned out to be extremely fruitful in observational astrophysics so they're really awesome and they're visually really cool so that helps with science communication used about 10 in this video alone um so I, yeah and it, i really liked this video i thought it was great let's read the comments neat now in the future i can say back in my day we could only see half the universe <laughs> now i understand what my dog feels like when i talk to him that's great a quasar's luminosity can be thousands of times that of whole galaxies I'll put it another way. About as bright as a 60-watt bathroom light at 3 a.m. Nice. Aliens. Oh, look. The humans are conducting their first baryon census. Humans, huh? Where are... Th huh? Aliens. Wait, hold on. I got you, homie. Shines laser pen at Earth. <laughs> That's silly. One of your best. I learned so much. The li Yeah, the Lyman Alpha Forest explanation was incredible. The Wim explanation was great. And so was the Whistler's. The whistles were beautifully represented as well. There was some stuff I wanted to chip in there, but it was fine. I love how beautifully presented these videos are. Yeah, he makes them very pretty. You know, I'm sure that appeals to all of the OCD people out there, but I'm not like that. I just want to throw it together, get it out there. Uh, great video. Watching this makes me amazed at how we can observe a simple phenomenon like redshift and somehow apply the knowledge to calculate the missing matter in the universe. Hmm. It's incredible. Well, when you really think about it, all of astrophysics has come from us just doing that exact thing, from looking at light and breaking down the spectra. That's how we figure out everything. But now we have, you know, the gravitational wave observatories, and it's kind of like a new window on the universe. I'm so happy to, rec to have received sufficient education to be able to understand at least some part of physics. Man, you can understand anything you like thanks to the internet. Go explore. Everything is can be found for pretty much free if you know the right places to look and if you guys this will finish on this if you want to learn some incredible stuff about physics for free at the the highest level mit open courseware they have a bunch of their actual like uh undergrad you know courses from their semesters at university at mit on the internet for free mit open courseware and you can watch some you know like you know the first few levels of quantum mechanics so if you if you guys are interested go check them out and you'll probably then see why i don't talk about math too much because it's just extremely esoteric and yeah i want to read this one actually i'm a phd student in astrophysics and sometimes 
I understand so many things from your videos that I didn't catch from the original paper. Nice. There's a lot of people um, in astrophysics or just anywhere physics that really love this guy. He's doing a great thing, you know, getting more people into physics. Anyway, we'll leave it there. Hope you guys enjoyed. I'll catch you next time.